Thank you, Jane. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm, this is my first time in um, spoke, spoke, Spokane, do we call it, or Spokane? OK, Spokane. Um, and, and thank you. Um, it's uh, just walking here from the hotel. I'm, have, I was, I'm almost thinking, hey, maybe I can move here. But maybe, maybe you wouldn't want that. I'd have to write a book about it. Um, uh, it's a, lo a lovely city you have, and I want to really thank uh, the Spokane Library Systems, both of them, the, the city and the county, for inviting me. It's a real honor to be um, part of the City Reads program, and also to Auntie's Books, um, which I love for the name alone. Uh, and, and then, of course, for the bookstore and all the lovely booksellers, so thank you. Um, so I am going to start uh, by with a little reading. It, it won't be too long, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and I thought I'd do a bit of a reading, and then we can do questions. And I can talk about the book and, and whatever in the course of questions, or else I can just start going. So I am going to read from the middle of the book, and I am assuming many of you have read the novel. Uh, it's an epistolary novel, and which means, uh, not to insult your intelligence, it means that it's a book written in letters. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, and uh, one of the letters that was always one that I was actually really afraid to write, because I knew that it had to be really, really good. Um, and I, I knew all of them had to be good, but this one in particular, I felt like I had to really dig deep down and hit it out of the park, is, is what I refer to as Bernadette's letter in, in my mind, even though there's many of her letters. But this is the big kind of centerpiece of the book where she describes moving to Seattle and why she doesn't like the city. And it's a letter that she writes to a friend of hers back in Los Angeles, uh, an architect friend. Uh, who she hasn't seen for 20 years. And, um, and I will just start reading this. At first, I was afraid to read this uh, in Seattle. Um, <laughs> you'll see why. The laughter says you know why. Um, and, and, and my first few readings, actually, uh, at Elliott Bay and at various places, I, the, the book had already kind of, there was publicity about the book and about how the book was so funny and, and I was really afraid to read the stuff because really the humor is just about how basically horrible Seattle is. So I ended up reading these very kind of straight, sincere passages and everyone would just kind of leave scratching their heads saying like, I thought this was supposed to be a funny book, you know, but I just didn't have the courage <laughs> to, to read these passages. But now screw it, I read them all the time and everyone seems to like them. Um, Okay, so here we go. This is Bernadette's, as I call Bernadette's letter. Paul, greetings from sunny Seattle, where women are gals, people are folks, a little bit is a skosh. You can't sit Indian style, but you can sit crisscross applesauce. <laughs> when the sun comes out, it's never called sun, always sunshine. Boyfriends and girlfriends are partners. Nobody swears, but someone occasionally might drop the F-bomb. You're allowed to cough, but only into your elbow. <laughs> and any re request, reasonable or unreasonable, is met with, no worries. Have I mentioned how much I hate it here? You probably wonder what I've been doing for the last 20 years. I've been resolving the conflict between public and private space in the single family residence. I'm joking. I've been ordering <laughs> off the internet. <laughs> so here we are in Seattle. First off, whoever laid out this city never met a four way intersection they didn't turn into a five way intersection. <laughs> They never met a two way street they didn't suddenly and for no reason turn into a one way street. They never met a beautiful view they didn't block with a 20-story old folks home with zero architectural integrity. Wait, I think that's the first time the words architectural and integrity have ever been used together in a discussion of Seattle. <laughs> the drivers here are horrible, and by horrible I mean they don't realize I have someplace to be. They're the slowest drivers you ever saw. 
If someone is at a five-way stoplight and growing old while they're waiting for the lights to cycle through, and finally, finally it's time to go, you know what they do? They start, then put on their brakes in the middle of the intersection. You're hoping they lost a half a sandwich under their seat and are digging for it, but no, they're just slowing down because after all, it is an intersection. Sometimes these cars have Idaho plates. <laughs> and I think, and I think, what the hell is a car from Idaho doing here? Then I remember, that's right, we neighbor Idaho. I've moved to a state that neighbors Idaho. <laughs> and any life that might be left in me kind of goes poof. My daughter did an art project called a step book, which started with the universe, then opened up to the solar system, then the earth, then the United States, then Washington State, then Seattle. And I honestly thought, what does Washington State have to do with her? And then I remembered, that's right, we live here. <laughs> Seattle, I've never met a city so overrun with runaways, drug addicts, and bums. Pike Place Market, they're everywhere. Pioneer Square, teeming with them. The flagship Nordstrom, have to step over them on your way in. The first Starbucks, one of them hogging the milk counter because he's sprinkling free cinnamon on his head. <laughs> oh, and they all have pit bulls. Many of them wearing handwritten signs with witticisms such as, I bet you a dollar you'll read this sign. Why does every beggar have a pit bull? Really? You don't know? It's because they're badasses and don't you forget it. I was downtown one early, I was downtown early one morning and I noticed the streets were full of people pulling wheelie suitcases. And I thought, wow, here's a city full of go-getters. Then I realized, no, these are all homeless bums who have spent the night in doorways and are packing up before they get kicked out. Seattle is the only city where you step in and you pray, please God, let this be dog <laughs> And don't get me started on Canadians. It's a whole thing. <laughs> Remember when the feds busted in on that Mormon polygamous cult in Texas a few years back? And the dozens of wives were paraded in front of the camera? And they all had this long mouse-colored hair with strands of gray? No hairstyle to speak of, no makeup, ashy skin, free to call facial hair, and unflattering clothes. And on cue, the Oprah audience was shocked and horrified. Well, they've never been to Seattle. <laughs> there are two hairstyles here, short gray hair and long gray hair. Let's play a game. I'll say a word and you say the first word that pops into your head. Ready? Me, Seattle, you, rain. What you've heard about the rain, it's all true. So you'd think it would become part of the fabric, especially among the lifers. But every time it rains and you have to interact with someone, here's what they'll say. Can you believe the weather? <laughs> and you want to say, actually, I can believe the weather. What I can't believe is I'm having a conversation with you about the weather. My first trip up here to Seattle, the realtor picked me up at the airport to look at houses. The morning batch were all craftsmen, which is all they have here, if you don't count the rash of view-busting apartment buildings that appear in inexplicable clumps, as if the zoning chief was asleep at his desk during the 60s and 70s and turned architectural design over to the Soviets. <laughs> Everything else is craftsmen, turn-of-the-century craftsmen, beautifully restored craftsmen, reinterpretation of craftsmen, need some love craftsmen, modern take on craftsmen. It's like a hypnotist put everyone from Seattle into a collective trance. You are getting sleepy. When you wake up, you will want to live only in a craftsman house. <laughs> the year won't matter to you. All that will matter is that the walls be thick, the windows tiny, the rooms dark, the ceilings low, and it be poorly situated on the lot.
Okay, bam, I'm done with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So um, I, I'll tell you just a little bit about how I got to such a poisonous place uh, uh, and turn it into art. Um, is I uh, moved from Los Angeles to Seattle uh, five years ago. Um, my boyfriend and I were both TV writers and he'd been wanting to move away for a long time and we just randomly picked Seattle. I, I knew nobody in, in the city and I in fact um, recently was updating my daughter's uh, school information you know the every year they have you update if you've moved or whatever and I just got sent this and so in August I looked at this and uh, this was left over from five years ago she's been in the same school for five years and I noticed that the emergency contact was the name of our realtor um, <laughs> uh, that's how little that's how I really knew nobody in Seattle so thank God she wasn't called one day to drive my daughter to the emergency room she had no idea uh, who she was um, but, uh, but so I um, moved up to Seattle and really thought that I would just have a good time because I'd always been easy to get along with and made friends quickly and it was never a problem. I'd moved several times. Um, I'd never moved in my 40s with a child without going to a workplace, which I realize are important components of moving to a new city. I realize that now. Um, so I moved up there, knew nobody, had no workplace, to kind of meet, have meet friends in, and I, I quit a job that was very um, successful, and I was very positively reinforced by. You know, when you're a TV writer and on some big hit shows, everyone knows what you do, and oh my God, I love that show, and and you get well paid, and you think that that's what life is like, you know. And so, I've written my first novel. This one is mine, which is about LA, and which I I loved. Um, this book and it came out and it did not sell very well it got very good reviews but it didn't sell very well and it was incredibly painful to me um i i didn't expect it it was really naive on my part it wasn't that i had a huge ego uh and i thought oh i'm going to be a big writer it was just really i i didn't know much about publishing and i didn't understand that most books don't become new york times bestsellers you know i was and and when my didn't it was very painful for me. Plus, I was in Seattle. I didn't know anybody. I really felt like I didn't connect with the people. Because for better or for worse, uh, my boyfriend will say it's for the worse, but I'll say it's for the better, uh, you be the judge, is that I'm really used to crazy, neurotic people. Uh, comedy writers, you know? And when I was saying, I don't like anyone here, and my boyfriend was saying, because that's just because you like crazy people, you know? And people up here are normal. And I, I couldn't, like, Get, get with that. And, and I'm much more into just crazy oversharing, swearing, you know, um, just mad people. And that's who I was used to. And so that was kind of my tribe, you know. And so um, when my book didn't do well, I was very upset and I hated Seattle. I couldn't find my way around the streets, which really I just think, God, this is just, I'm just bitching about the fact that I didn't know how to drive around the city, um, which really w was a big part of my life, uh, not knowing how to get around the city. And I thought I'd never write again. And I irrationally blamed Seattle for that. And